All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode 71. It is uh, Friday here, 2 a.m. in the morning for me here in Taiwan. Hopefully, everybody had a fantastic Thanksgiving. I don't really celebrate. I'm in Taiwan. It's not really a holiday here, but uh, I did appreciate it, did like it back when I was in Canada. But uh, one thing I can say I'm definitely thankful for is that people actually show up. They're interested in my work. So very, very much appreciate you doing that. Um, smash the like button, of course, as usual. And I'm just noticing on my comments there, I don't know if you can actually see the poll. I threw one up there. I can't see it anymore, so I don't know if it disappeared on me. But I'm running a little bit of an experiment today, so I will explain a little bit more as we go. But I'm going to try to be as casual about it as possible, but just notice that there's a poll there. And I'm considering making a small change to the format, depending on how people vote. Of course, the live streams, I do consider it mostly for the community, mostly for all of you. So I will default to what the majority of people want, but uh, basically comes down to whether you you prefer to see podcasts that are pre-recorded, you know, they're probably a little bit shorter, a little more succinct, or just fully live side tangents and rants and all the ums and ahs that come along with live stream. Depends on your style. I will, of course, default to the community. But what we're going to do today, basically, uh, it's going to be you know, 15, 20 minutes. I'll try to keep it pretty quick, but mostly about butterflies on the VXX and the UVXY, something that we trade quite a bit in the VTS community. I don't know if anybody out there um, likes these trades, but I do want to talk about it a little bit more because it is one of my favorites. I do think that most people should probably stuff something like this into their portfolio in some capacity. I will explain in a little bit why that's so important. But the first section that we're going to do is essentially I'm going to break down the difference between a standard butterfly option, which you've probably seen before in some capacity, maybe not on the volatility ETPs, but you've probably traded a butterfly before, and then compare that to the broken wing butterfly, which is a slight variation on it. I will explain both of those and when you should sort of use which one. There's situations where they're kind of a toss-up. There are situations where one of them is clearly better than the other, and I'll outline that. And then the second segment that I'm going to do today, we actually trade these quite a bit throughout the year, and we closed one out yesterday, and it was one day before expiration. Typically, we'll wait for the last day or two. And I got a bunch of follow-up questions. Well, why would you do that? It was a very specific trade that was literally sitting at the perfect expiration with one day to go. And so I wanted to prepare something and explain to everybody that this wasn't just a gut feeling. There is actually a specific way you can determine whether you should close these trades out early or not. So we're going to go into that as well. And then, of course, in the comments, I see a few people asking questions already. I'm going to try to keep this fairly quick. So we're going to do, you know, 30, 40 minutes of open Q&A. Feel free to ask me anything you want. Put those questions in the comments section now. Let's just see if everybody's, somebody's screaming at me. I can't hear you. Your, you know, computer screen's off. Everything looks to be more or less okay. This is a good one. Broken Wing Butterflies are my favorite. Awesome, because we're going to talk about it in two segments today. More time. And okay, I'll get to those questions in a minute. But yeah, if you want to ask your questions, of course, go ahead and do that. So... Let's get into the first section. So the first thing that we have to discuss is you have to kind of understand where this strategy fits in. So what we essentially do is the VTS portfolio is five strategies currently. This can change based on certain situations, different years. We have different strategies. But, you know, I try to keep pretty consistent with most of these. They've been in the portfolio for, you know, over 12 years now. But it's the purple one there, the volatility trend that we're talking about. And this strategy... I consider it a short volatility strategy, and we are using butterfly options and broken wing butterfly options to essentially short the volatility ETPs, the VXX, the UVXY. So that's the strategy that we're talking about. Now, what I want to do is, first of all, open a trade in a very standardized way and just show you what a basic butterfly option would look like. So I have many steps to determine what trades we're actually going to be taking, but something pretty simplistic that I can just fire through really quickly here. We have what's called a volatility dashboard. This is my daily email. Sorry about the scrolling. We'll go down here. 
I've got a dashboard in every daily email for the VTS subscribers, where we basically break down all the volatility ETPs and what we are expecting them to be trading in a one day, five days, 10 days, 21 days in advance. So this is good for option traders who are trying to set those strikes. This gives you a much better indication of what's going on. And this is based on current volatility levels. So I suppose the one that is the most relevant here would be the VX30, the VIX roll yield. But I can basically determine what the decay factor of these volatility ETPs are, and we can get a much better idea for how to set the highest probability trade. So let me check what the VXX is at right now. It's getting crushed today, which, you know, in our portfolio, as short vol traders, this is always a good thing, but it's at 1744. So I'm going to have to make a slight adjustment here because you can see when I sent out the email, it was actually kind of at 18. So let's go 1745 and we will reassess this. And now it looks like 14 days in advance. So if I were to just do a mock-up trade 14 days from now, the 8th of December, I would be looking at something, statistically speaking, expiring around 1632. So what I could do is I could open what's called a butterfly option, 17, 16, 15. This is just a standard butterfly that you would see. And the price is right here, right now. Of course, when I sent my email, it was right here. So it was definitely more advantageous a couple hours ago, but we can't control the market. Intraday trading is what it is. But this is what your butterfly option looks like. Okay, so here's the price now. And of course, what do we know about the VXX? It does decay downward most of the time. Let's try to stretch this out just in case anybody isn't aware of what it actually looks like on a long-term chart. This is what we're trying to do. We know that the VXX more than likely is going to decay down into our profit range. So this is the type of setup that's very good to capture that. Now, standard butterfly has equal loss on both sides of the trade. Okay, so these are really good because typically the loss here is minimized and the profit is much larger in the middle. Now, when I sent out the email, have to say, it was about 15. So it was looking like you risk $15 to potentially make about 85. Now, what is it trading at? 34, it's still a trade that I would probably take, but it has changed a little bit. But anyway, you're risking 34 and you can still make $66. So it's a good risk reward profile for something that we know is gonna kind of expire over here. But there is something else that you can do, and this gets into the broken wing butterfly. What if, instead of doing a 17, 16, 15, watch what happens if I took the 15 and put it at 14. Well, what happens with a broken wing butterfly, nothing changes in the middle, but you're basically taking risk from over here and you're stuffing it over here on the low side. So remember when you're looking at this, VXX being down is actually shorting volatility. So we want it to move in this direction, but with a broken wing butterfly, we just don't want it to go so far that it goes into the max loss territory, which would be below 14. You're talking about an epic move downward. It doesn't happen very often, but that's what the broken wing butterfly is. So super common question that we get, and that's why I'm gonna go through it today. When do you choose between doing a standard butterfly and a broken wing butterfly. So there's many other reasons as well, but the top four that I think most people are gonna, that's most relevant for the most number of people, let me review what those are. So the first one actually did come up today. Let me close a few of these windows, sorry. Um, what is going on? I've got everything open right now. Uh, it actually did come up today, but the first thing is that the premium needs to be significantly lower to open up the broken wing butterfly instead. So what this would be is you can see the premium for the regular butterfly is 32 cents right now. The premium for the broken wing butterfly is 31 cents. So right now they're actually the same premium, more or less within one penny. Now this is a situation where you wouldn't want to open a broken wing butterfly because there's no incentive to do that. The premium is basically the same. So I'll just run through this quickly. You're risking 32 to make a possible 68, and you're risking 32 over here. If you do a broken wing that's charging 31 debit, basically the same thing here, 31, basically the same thing here, you can make 69 maximum, but down here you're introducing a much larger loss, right? 
Now, it's very unlikely to get there, but again, statistically, why would you do that when there's no benefit? Now, what, ha what happens quite often and why we most of the time use broken wing butterflies is let's say this one's at 32, it's not uncommon at all for this one to be significantly lower. And that's really what we're talking about. So if you could go from a trade that looks like this down to a trade that looks like this, then you would choose the broken wing butterfly because the premium is significantly better. Essentially, what it comes down to is that furthest out strike. You can see the 15 here and the 14 here. If there is a significant difference between these two, which there often is, could be five or 10 cents, sometimes more than that, 20 cents, then you would choose the broken wing butterfly. But right now, zero to three cents, zero to one cent, it's basically the same trade, right? There is no reason to extend it out. So in this situation, it does appear as of today that the butterfly is the better trade. And that is also basically why in today's email, I sent out a standard butterfly, equal distance strike trade, because there's no benefit, but that's one of the things that you're looking for. The second thing would be the risk of volatility crush should be lower if you're going to open a broken wing butterfly. So remember, a broken wing, you're putting risk from here over to here. So the only negative outcome of this trade is that you get so much volatility crush in two weeks that it goes from 1750 all the way to 14. So when would that happen, right? Otherwise, don't open the trade if there's a significant chance that that's actually going to happen. And there is one situation where that is an elevated probability, and it would be on a recent volatility spike. So the market gets a little bit scared, something in the market happens for whatever reason, volatility rises. It's these periods right after that, right after here, right after here, for example, where if there's a news headline that resolves the issue and the market is just suddenly not scared anymore, well, then what's going to end up happening? There could be a significant flush down right after one of these temporary volatility spikes. Massive flush down when the market decides, okay, it's nothing, right? No big deal. Let's just jump back into the deep end of the pool. That's what can happen, right? So if that's the case and there is a significant chance of volatility crush, well, then you wouldn't want to set up this trade because you're introducing a lot of loss there. You could actually just go to this one where it's equal loss on both sides. And you don't know if it's going to stop here or keep going. So that actually matters a lot as well. Don't need a calculator. So that's the second thing. If your volatility crush is very high probability, probably default to the regular butterfly. Otherwise, broken wing butterflies are typically a little bit better. The third thing would be is if you wanted the high side of the trade to be lower risk. Again, if you're looking at this in a typical situation, I'm going to kind of fake it here, but the broken wing butterfly, let's say this regular one, you can lose 30 bucks. If you wanted to reduce the high side risk to the minimum amount possible, this would be a case where let's say you weren't really sure whether the VXX was going to decay at all. Maybe it's been decaying for a few weeks. Maybe there's an upcoming news headline, some type of binary event. Then at that time, sometimes you want to just have very little loss on the high side. And you want to throw as much of that risk to the low side as possible. I do this sometimes as well, but that kind of gets into the fourth reason, which is look at the rest of your portfolio. If you are net long equities, net short volatility, then again, you've probably already got plenty of exposure to that low side. For our portfolio, for example, we've already got the defensive rotation, the tactical volatility, and strategic tail risk. Iron condors are delta neutral. But we've got three strategies that under normal conditions are going to be net long equities, net short vol. So I don't actually need more strategies in my portfolio that are going to profit from big volatility decline, do I? I've already got three of them. So if that's the case, I don't actually mind putting all the risk over here, right? Because it doesn't really affect my total portfolio. I don't care where the profit comes from as long as my portfolio continues to go up. These are five strategies, very low correlation to each other. I don't really care where my money is coming from. So if I'm already strongly net long the market, well, broken wing butterfly is just going to be better, isn't it? Because let's say this does have that epic volatility crush. The VXX goes from 1750 to 14 in two weeks. Well, if that's the case, my 1% allocation, which is what we allocate, I will lose 1% of my portfolio if that were to happen. Massive crush, 1% of my money gone. But doesn't that also mean that this strategy that's long the SVXY, well, this one will make twice as much. 
right? The VXX at that point would have dropped 20%. The SVXY would be up 10% because it's a 0.5 times leveraged product, right? There's a little bit of day-to-day, you know, beta slippage and whatnot, but roughly speaking, up 10. If it's 20% of the portfolio, this one, that one would make 2%. This one loses one. So I'm already up money. And then this one is net long two times the NASDAQ index. Certainly, if the VXX dropped 20% in two weeks, this would make a whole bunch of money. And so would this SPY position here. So I would make far more money if that were to happen. And this is why I always say volatility trend is technically a net short volatility strategy because I'm trying to get that decay factor and just basically chase it for as long as it's going to go. Just layering those trades over and over farther out in time every two weeks, every, you know, 10 to 20 days ish, just put on as many as I can 80 to 90% of the time it is decaying downward. But I don't actually need to add more stuff to my portfolio that would be a problem for me if there was a sudden volatility spike. So the broken wing butterfly allows me to short volatility with no risk to the upside volatility spike. So it's far better for this portfolio. And that's what I said, most people should consider putting something of this into their portfolio as well, because the vast majority of investors, I would probably say 99% at least, are typically net long the market. So what do you need? Well, you need inverse correlation. You need something that's not going to kill you if the market suddenly spikes. That's really the danger. So that's when the broken wing butterfly would actually be advantageous. If you are already net long, go ahead and throw all the risk to the low side. And if the worst case happens, well, I'm not going to say who cares. It is a 1% loss, but you're going to make 5 or 10% in the rest of the portfolio. It's not going to matter at all. We're almost daring it to go down, to be honest. Right now, I am in a position where I would lose money over here. Well, I would love for that to happen. I mean, right now, to be honest, if two weeks from now, the VXX was at $14, I would be very happy with that outcome. So um, that's essentially the broken wing butterfly. That's why we do those, I would say, certainly 80, 90% of the time. But there are situations, like I said, these rare times, like now, where the premium is the same. So why just double up on the low side risk when you're not getting paid for it? But uh, hopefully everybody learned a little something about which one you should be choosing there. Uh, It's pretty important. Like I always say, there's nothing in the market that's just going to radically change your outcomes. You're not going to find one little thing that's just, now I'm suddenly making all this money. It's it's really about little edges here and there. It's about shaving a few dollars of trade fees. It's about getting a little more efficient with your position sizing. It's just little mental game strengthening, doing the right things in, in difficult times. Choosing between a butterfly and a broken wing butterfly and knowing when is slightly better than the other. All of these things are going to add up and over time, 10 little edges that will change your future. That will make you go from somebody who's going to struggle financially to somebody who's just going to be set because you're making this great rate of return. Of course, don't overspend, you know, live below your means, make sure you save a little bit of money every month, but you get the point. It's about small edges and choosing the right one, definitely an edge that we take advantage of in our portfolio. So now remember the poll that I have running. Let me just check really quickly because I also fired it off on Twitter as well. So if you don't follow me on Twitter, it is at VolatilityVix. Go ahead and give me a follow there. But the poll, I basically said the same thing. This is interesting. Okay, 35 people have voted. It's, yeah, let's call it even. Statistically on that few votes, yeah, let's call it even. So would people prefer just off the cuff, totally live, or would people prefer something prepared? So we'll see what the community likes. But now let's go to the second segment, which is talking about why I closed my broken wing butterfly early. So I've got a great topic today for all of you VXX and UVXY traders out there that do like to short volatility with options. One thing I hope that you've learned in your journey so far is that it's not reliable long term for us to be relying on our gut instincts and just personal market predictions to be trading these products. We actually have to look at the numbers and understand how they work, how much they move around, where we're expecting them to go. So today I'm going to break down a VXX broken wing butterfly that I closed out yesterday, one day before expiration. I'm going to show you exactly why I came to that 
that conclusion, and hopefully you can use information like this in your own trading. All right, so the first thing really quickly here, the VTS portfolio is currently made up of five strategies, all with a 20% weighting each. The purple one there called volatility trend, that's the strategy we're talking about today. It shorts volatility with broken wing butterflies on either the VXX or the UVXY, depending on which is priced more advantageously. So right here, this is what the trade looked like on the day that I initiated the... Well, that was a short experiment, wasn't it? I can see the comments. Echo, echo, I'm getting an echo. I tried to fix that, but I wasn't able to. Okay, so let me just break down. Let's just kind of, let's just do, do this. So essentially what I was going to try to do, and I still might do it, of course, but it, what I was trying to have is a segment one that was just totally live, like I did before, you know, 10 minutes of me just talking, like I always do. We've done many, many live streams. And, um, you know, of course, some of them go two, three hours long. I don't mind at all doing a totally live off the cuff live stream. So I'm actually fine with that if that's what people want. But what I did is earlier today, I shot a little segment and I recorded it. And then I spent, you know, maybe 15 minutes just chopping it up a little bit and getting, getting rid of the things that I, you know, maybe didn't have to say. Stuff like, uh, you know, sometimes I'll go off on a side tangent and then afterwards you'll think, wow, that didn't really add too much to it. I can just chop off four sentences or whatever. So I've also noticed that all the podcasts that I personally watch, they're all pre-recorded. I, I don't know anybody who just goes live and just answers questions live from the community. So kind of cool there. But I was hoping that people would have a side to side to compare to. But that didn't work because apparently there's a big echo going on. I think that happens when I play a video. There's something in the back end of this software that for some reason, I can't turn that echo off without affecting something else on my live streams. So anyway, I'm going to have to go through that segment manually. So let me open the right spreadsheet while we're doing this. But please vote. Please let me know what you would prefer. Obviously, it would have been better if we had just a straight up head to head there. It didn't work out. Well, welcome to live streaming. But what do you prefer? The podcast that you look at, what I could do is I could pre-record a 15, 20-minute thing, maybe two or three segments that are very condensed and very to the point, kind of like my videos. And then I could just open it up to 45 minutes of open Q&A, just like before. Or I could just continue doing what we've always been doing, which is just me sitting here trying to do the best I can consciously trying to not um and awe ah and all that stuff that's quite annoying. Live streaming is not so easy. I don't know if you've ever tried it. You should give it a shot. It's definitely worth doing. It's a skill that people should develop, but it's not so easy. So master volatility, is that the right one? I've got a lot of spreadsheets here. Let's see if that's the right one. So essentially, yeah, let me, um, let me just do this all manually. The point that I was trying to make is we had a broken wing butterfly open, a uh, two-week cycle, kind of like we always do. And let me just make sure before I start yapping here. Yes. Okay. This is the right spreadsheet. So we had this trade open and I typically let them go right to the end because the butterfly structure itself, it is actually quite important to let it go to, at least to the second last day or the last day, because that type of structure does take a little while for the profit to come. It's not the type of thing that you can set up stop losses and stop gains. Like iron condors, it works out fantastic to have stops in that case, but butterflies, not so much. So we don't do that. But I did close it one day early. And the reason that I closed it one day early is because the trade was actually dead center. So did I shut everything down? What I could do is open the video that I just made like this and just show you. So can you all see this? Okay, good. So this was the trade as we opened it. The day that we opened it two weeks ago, it looked like this. Like I explained, the broken wing butterfly, here was the price here, and we're expecting it to get to gay, decay downward over the next two weeks. That's what we're trying to do. And we know that it's probably not gonna go to 16. That would be an epic collapse. So that's what we were expecting to happen. And what ended up actually happening yesterday or Wednesday, because yesterday was a holiday, this is what the trade looked like. It was a near perfect trade, right? It decayed from 20 right down to 18, and we were right in the peak. 
But you can see there's one day to go. This pink line, which is the daily profit curve, it's not touching the top of that turquoise. If I wait one more day and the VXX ends up expiring today at $18, I would make full profit. And I had a bunch of people saying, well, why would you do that? It's absolutely dead center. Isn't this a perfect trade? And the truth is, no, this is actually not, a, not the best situation to let it go another day. And the reason is, if you look at what's happening here, I wish you could see this video. It was actually pretty decent. But the 103 profit that this contract is sitting at would be the same one day later at about 1830 and about 1770. So you're talking about 30 cents on an $18 VXX. If today, and of course, as we've seen, it's decayed further than that. Spoiler alert, I should have closed it out, which I did, which was, you know, good. We maximized our money. But we are talking about about a 1.6% up or down move. If it goes up by more than 1.6, I'm better off closing a day early. If it goes down by more than 1.6, I'm better off closing a day early. Anything inside that range means I would actually have made more money by waiting one extra day. So the whole point of this thing was to say that how do you make that decision, right? There's a lot of traders, I would say almost all traders out there, they're just going to kind of use their gut instinct. Well, what do I think? Is it going to go up 1.6? Truth is, I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody on Twitter knows, even though everybody on Twitter says they know. Um, yeah, it's... One of those things. So for me personally, of course, you know my style. I'm going to crunch numbers on it. So I have a little calculator that basically, you know, I can see how much the VXX decays over one day. And I've got this for all of the products and all the decay factors and whatnot. But we can basically just punch it in right here. So 1.6 up, you can see the VXX goes up on a one day basis over 1.6%, 23% of the time. And then we can do 1.6 on the negative side, and that happens 35% of the time. So little side tangent, but you might be wondering why those numbers are not the same. Well, obviously it's because the VXX over time actually decays quite a bit. So there is a negative skew here. So we're not, of course, expecting those to be the same, but over 1.6, under 1.6, if you see within the range over here, 42% of the time. That's the number. So basically, it is exactly on a historical basis. We can say 42% of the time, the VXX would stay within that range, and I would be better off keeping the trade open. But that means 58% of the time, I'm actually better off closing it one day early and taking that profit. So that's basically the answer, right? It doesn't get much more specific than that. But there's another thing that I wanted to point out that this doesn't always happen like that. It actually is a more specific situation to a perfect expiration. Because if you were to imagine that the price is somewhere, I think I talked about this, some, I'll just leave this here, somewhere over here, and you were one day out and there was a 50-50 up or down, well, now it's not the same thing, is it? Because down, it only costs you a little bit, but up, depending on how much up, you could make many multiples of your money. So right here, dead center, you have more to lose than gain, right? If I wait one more day, I can only make another 50 bucks, but I could end up losing more than this, more than 50, more than 100. It could actually go into a losing position. So I have a lot more to lose than gain, so it's actually better to close it. But if you're sitting over here, you have a lot more to gain than lose, right? I mean, I'll risk that every single time. With one day to go, if the price is here, I'll absolutely let that trade go for another day. And sure, it could go up and I could lose the money, but it's also very likely that it's going to go down and I would make a bunch of money. So it's not always the same thing. This is one of the unfortunate things. I wish there was just a rule that I could just tell you, this is the stop loss rule. Like iron condors, 50% of the premium, take your trade off. That's it. Super simple. Butterflies are not like that. There's always going to be a little bit of a discretionary element there. And uh, that's why we closed it early. And what is it right now? Like I said, it was a good decision to close it early because um, down 4.3%. 4 it's all the way down to 1742. So if you want to see where that would have been, it's not like we would have been losing a bunch of money. 1742, somewhere around there. So, you know, this contract would have made 80 if it expires here at the end of the day, would have cost me 20 bucks. But again, the point is, what if it was an epic collapse? Well, it could have cost me the whole thing. So 
Uh, that's why I closed the trade early for all you VTS community people out there. Pretty straightforward. Crunch the numbers on everything. That's, of course, my job. This is what I do. I'm not suggesting you have to do that, but I would always say that you should have a spreadsheet of your own. Start tracking these things. If you're tuning into my live stream, I would assume that means that you're interested in trading. And so the best way to get into this type of thing is to just get your spreadsheet out, start compiling things, start thinking about ideas and say, well, I wonder what would happen if I did X, Y, and Z. Go ahead and test it out. Take one lot contract sizes and get in there and start doing your live trading. That's the best way you're going to learn. Risk or uh, trial and error, of course, always. You're going to learn a lot more doing that. What a lot of people end up doing, they fall into this trap where and I don't want to scare people away, like turning off my live stream, but they get a lot of education, right? They're just watching YouTube videos over and over and over again, more, more, I'm learning so much, but really you're just, you know, paralysis by analysis. What you need to do is just get in there and start trading. So keep it small, get your spreadsheet out, start compiling this data. And uh, yes, you are going to be far better off. All right. That was an epic fail, wasn't it? But please give me a little vote. I don't know if the vote, the poll is still in here, but um, all live 100% and then move into the questions. So that took 31 minutes. That wasn't so bad, actually. But uh, if I did it pre-recorded and I chopped it all up, I probably could have communicated the same message in 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less. So it depends. What do you want? You want to just listen to all my rants and side tangents, or do you want me to organize my thoughts and present it to you and then jump back on and do the live stream? Or option three for VTS community members, if you just prefer standalone videos plus live Q&As, I could just stop doing these segments, just prepare more individual videos, and then every week just do a one hour straight up Q&A session and don't even bother with the segments. Three choices for you. Let me know which one works best. And I will default to the majority, of course. I don't care either way. I think it's all fun. I enjoy doing all of it. I like putting together stuff. All right. If there are 50 million more short than long positions on a commodity future and all investors roll their position to the next month, is the price neutral or would the price go up? If there are 50 million more short than long positions on a commodity future. And are, are you trying to get at how the volatility ETPs would handle the future role there? Computers all roll their position to the next month. Is the price neutral or would the price go up? I'm not really sure what you're trying to get at here. I'm assuming that you're talking about rolling a month forward, but the volatility ETPs roll a day forward. Um, if everybody rolled their positions, you would just have the same position, right? I don't know what you're getting at here. If you're talking about volatility ETPs, what would end up happening is there would just be that general sliding down the curve and the products like VXX and whatnot would go down a little bit. That's essentially what the roll yield is doing as it's rolling forward. As long as everything is being maintained, then yes, there's that bleed down. Commodity stuff's throwing me off there, but... I would assume that is just regular rolling and rebalancing, and you would see whatever the natural decay factor of that product is. That's what you would have happens. Sorry, I don't really know what you're getting at there. That's another problem too. What I used to do is I used to post about three, four days in advance. Everybody can ask their questions. I did this maybe two or three times, and there's no chance that I would ever misunderstand somebody's question if you do that. But when they're live, of course, there is always the probability that your brain kind of freezes and you don't really know what the person is asking. So um, include that in your voting as well, that sometimes I don't, I never punt on questions. I try to give an answer for no matter what happens, no matter what comes. But there are times when people have to email me after and go, that's not at all what I was talking about. So <laughs> Little inefficiency there. Sorry about that. What's the best way to simulate an options trade like VIXM or VXZ? Tricky. Since VIXM and VXZ have low trading volume, what would be a good underlying asset to use? So the problem isn't the trading volume. See, th there's a couple of issues here that a lot of people are scared to trade 
either the VIXM directly or trade options on it because they see the volume is low. But you got to remember that there's there's two things happening here. And I will answer your question. I'll make sure I'll circle back to it. But the first thing is that volume doesn't quite mean the same thing in volatility ETB space as it does in regular stock trading. And I've personally never had an issue with any trading volume on products like that. So yes, you could say, oh, there's only 80 million assets under management or 50 million under management. But it, it actually turns out that you can still get efficient fills. With the options, it's kind of the same thing. You might think, wow, the bid ask spread looks so wide. But in a practical sense, when you're in there trading, it's not so bad. The second thing you have to always remember is with a product like the ones you're talking about, when is the volume highest, right? The, the volume numbers that you're looking at are typically averages over a long term. When is the volume the highest on these products? It's when you would want to be buying them, right? It's certainly in the VTS community, we don't buy the VIXM, which is a long volatility ETP, M4 to M7 for anybody who's wondering. We don't buy that when volatility is super low and we're trying to anticipate some type of volatility spike. We're not contrarians in that sense. We're trend followers. So we're not going to touch those products when everything's calm and the volume's lower at those times. But when I start wanting to get into those products and when the general public starts actually ramping up the volume, that's when, you know, that's when we're going to be getting into it as well. So I, I say all that to just say, don't worry so much about the volume. Keep track of your fill prices. Make sure you're not just getting totally robbed every time you do it, but it shouldn't be an issue. The reason I say it's not a volume problem, there is an issue here. If you're trying to simulate a VIXM trade with options, the problem is Vega is going to be very high when you're trying to enter that trade. Right? You're not, like I said, you're not going to be a contrarian buying it when vol super low. You're going to be buying into a headwind already. And so what you can have happen is, as we know, if the market settles and news event comes out and everybody calms down, those products can get hit pretty hard the next day. And then if you're simulating it with options, you can get another secondary hit that you bought an option contract while volume or while volatility was rising. You paid probably... I don't want to say too much, but you paid more than normal and that can get hit as well. So that's the biggest problem. Typically, when you're trying to simulate these with options, you could do some type of risk reversal. You could do a vertical spread, spread the pricing out so it's separated by maybe $5. So you get a little bit of extra punch to it. But you want to do something that's not completely long vega. You don't just want to buy a call option on VIXM and think, well, I'm simulating the product. No, it's going to get hit. If, if there's a reversal, which happens about 80% of the time, right? You try to fade vol and it actually will fade. If you jump in there with a long call, you, you can get hit pretty hard pretty quickly. So I would say that make sure that you're really managing your Vega exposure to whatever you're trying to simulate when you jump into this. Um, stock replacement works fantastic for stock replacement long put options on VXX. Works great for simulating SPY or the NASDAQ. It gets a little bit tricky when you're talking about long Vega trades on a long vol product purchased when volatility has already spiked. It's, uh, it, the losses can pile up. Now, if what you expect to happen happens, great. You're going to make a bunch of money anyway, and you're not going to worry about it. But uh, just be aware. Try to manage that. Try to get longs and shorts in the same trade structure, and you should be far better off. Okay, the concept of options trading has been a really great experience for me. Good. That's awesome. Options trading is something that I want to tell everybody to do no matter what. It's just, you know, stock trading is quite binary, long, short. But uh, option trading, you can build anything, you know, sky's the limit. It's up to your imagination. So you can control for so many more variables. People think options trading is speculative in nature. And, oh, it's all about buying long calls on Tesla and seeing or, or AMC, right? No, it's a risk risk management tool. That's essentially what it is. So the personal risk psychology is really challenging. You are always missing out with any choice you make. Okay. I'm, I'm always leaving money on the table with any choice. This concept is very difficult to accept. Yeah. I, I see where your brain is going. So for me personally... One of the issues, side tangent, golf analogy, of course, incoming. I used to be a pro golfer. And a lot of people ask me, well, why is professional golf so beneficial for transitioning into a career in the investment world? One of those things is 
sort of managing your brain and your negative thoughts, there's nothing really more important to a golfer, professional golfer, under the gun, last day of a tournament, all the pressure, all the people watching you to manage your negative self-talk and manage those directions that your brain is going to go. So for me, when I transition into trading, I retired in 2005 and I've been option trading since then, I don't think this way. But I, I know what you're saying. It's just, it's not beneficial to think this way for, for a few layers of reasons. First of all, you're always missing out with any choice. Well, control your controllables. Everything in the world is missing out on every decision we ever make from the moment we wake up until we go to sleep. Everything you do. If you go, you know, make yourself breakfast, well, you did that at the expense of all the other things you could have done, right? But our brain doesn't think that way. So why would you think that way when you're trading? Of course, there's opportunity cost in everything you do, but you just control your controllables, throw it out, right? I've always talked about the bubble in golf where everything that I can control is in my bubble and everything I can't control, just throw it out of the bubble. It doesn't matter. So don't think that way. Of course, there's an opportunity cost, but yeah, there's an opportunity cost with brushing your teeth. You know, you could have done something else. Maybe that something else would have been better than brushing your teeth. Um, I'm always leaving money on the table with any choice. Again, technically true, not useful for trading. This concept is very difficult to accept. I get it. That's why I said trading is about small edges, and one of them is managing your negative self-talk, right? It's something you need to do. So again, only focus on the three or four things you can control in the moment. Options trading is awesome because you can create these structures that you can't with a binary, long, short stock trading, right? But if you allow your brain to go to places you will be paralyzed. You'll be frozen. You'll always think, well, I can't do this because what if this was better? I can't get into that trade now because what if two hours later the price is better? Well, I don't want to do this because what happens if on Friday the S&P OPEX is a, is a big issue or, you know, whatever is in the, on the Twitter reel? Well, what happens if that screws up my trade? You just never trade again. You, just, you might as well just close the computer and stop trading. So I would say... It's kind of a general thing, but continue working on your mental game. You got to control your controllables. Don't think that way. Think of it the other way. I don't know if I should go on two golf analogies at the same time, but you always want to think positive things. You always want to think that what you're doing was the best thing, even though your brain technically knows it's not true. And one story I wanted to tell you, when I was growing up, when I was just starting to learn to play tournaments and compete you kind of end up playing with the same five or six people in all these tournaments. You know, they all kind of rise to the top. And I played with this one guy. And every time I played with him, he would talk very positively. He actually was instrumental in my, in my development, but he would talk very positively. So we'd show up at the golf course. Imagine it's pouring rain, right? And here I am. I'm a 16-year-old kid. I, I complain about everything, every bad shot. I kick my golf bag and whatever it is. But this guy, you know, I'm for whatever reason, he would say, oh, I, I love playing in the rain. It's awesome. You know why I love playing in the rain? Because it really forces me to, you know, grip, gri grip very softly, swing a little bit slower so I'm not slipping. And I tend to play a lot better that way. So I play better in the rain. I was like, wow, that's an interesting way to look at it. So I mean, a few weeks go by, another month goes by, I'm paired with the same guy in a different tournament. And it's perfectly sunny out. It's just awesome weather. And this guy will say, Oh, I, I love playing in the sunny weather. This is amazing for me, right? I can just, I can grip it. I can smash it. I can swing as hard as I want. I always play my best in good weather. I'm thinking, well, he said the exact opposite thing a, a month ago. Like, what's going on? And then you'll show up another couple months later and he'd be like, I, I'll be like, I hate playing in the wind. It affects my ball flight and all. And he'll be, he'll say something to himself like, I love playing in the wind. You know, all these other players, they don't like to play in the wind. So it gives me a competitive edge. And I always play my best when it's windy. So no matter what happened for that summer, I remember the summer when I was 16, um, not that he's ever watching, but Bob, you know who you are. Uh, he, he just taught me so much about how to frame things, right? You got to go out there and play anyway. You're going to have to hit your shots. But he just had this way of framing everything. So no matter what situation he was encountering, it was always the perfect situation for him. And since then, I've always tried to do the same thing. I've always tried to frame it because 
you got to show up and play anyway. So you might as well give yourself the best chance you can. And trading is the same thing. You have to make that trade. All right. I can't tell you how many emails I get every day. People saying, should I execute my trade at 12? Should I wait till 2.30? Should, you know, should I wait till after the gamma exposure flip point comes out or whatever it is? Just control your controllables. Set your brain up so that you're always positive and heading in the right direction and uh, you will be better off. You can't lie to your brain outright unless you're schizophrenic, but you can frame things better and over time you'll be that person that <laughs> I love playing in the rain. I play my best golf in the rain. I love when it's sunny days. I'm awesome on sunny days. No matter what happens, you're going to be the best. I'm glad you're doing the choosing for me. I think this has to do with just opening and closing trades, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I will always do that. That's what the emails are for. But of course, with VTS, what I could do with everybody is this is my daily email, right? So we start out, I tell everybody if there's a trade to take that day, if there is, you know, they'll take it. If not, there's just a daily blog. But I've got all the strategies listed out, right? There's a daily blog. Um, today was talking about a new trade we took, this. I think I was hacking on Dave Ramsey a little bit down here in another clip. And then we've got the we've got a library full of courses that, that we have. Um, I don't know if I should open those and show people. No, I shouldn't do that. Then we've got the full volatility dashboard. So my point is what I could do is I could just have an email that's this long, just say, take these trades and that's it. And for a lot of people in the VTS community, they don't listen to all the education that I do. They just take the trades. They trust me. I've been doing this for 18 years. My track record's really good. They just want to follow the trades. I could do that. But what I also do is I just, I'm an absolute workaholic and I put out education and people can learn as much as they want. So for somebody like you who said, you're glad you choose, you could just default and just listen to me and you just can skip all of this stuff if you wanted. Or you can learn as much as possible. I always consider, you know, what type of people are going to follow me, follow my work. You got some people on the one end that literally I'm just replacing their financial advisor, right? Financial advisors make the decisions. They don't even tell you what they're doing. You don't even know it. You don't see anything. Well, guy like me, you get the trades every day. It's cheaper. Of course, flat rate subscription is always going to be way cheaper than paying an asset, you know, a percentage on their assets. And over time, it scales to lower than index fund fees. That's what a flat subscription is. So if you've got $250,000 and you're paying 80 bucks a month, it's, it's really, really low fees. But if you're with a financial advisor, you're paying 1% of assets. The more money you have, the more money you lose, you know, it scales exponentially. And you've probably seen studies where over time, you can lose 30 or 40% of your nest egg because you've been paying a financial advisor 1% or 2% of, you know, your money. So, uh, but some people are just going to do that. They're just going to follow the signals. They're not going to look at anything. Other people are just passing through. They're just coming to learn as much as they can in a three or four month period, pour through the courses, try to figure out the volatility dashboard metrics, watch all my live streams, ask all your questions. And then four months later, they've got their own spreadsheet. They've got their own strategies and they're off to the races. Some people do that. We've got the two extremes. I always say, you can, you can be as involved or as, uh, as inactive as you want. It's up to you. But I will always continue to put the, the, the work in. There will always be mass, massive uh, education. But if you want to just read the email, trust me, that's also, also good too. Do you mind evaluating a short calendar for UVXY selling a 90-day call and buying a 30 to 45-day call? Evaluating a short calendar. Um, I mean, your tip, there, there's going to be a difference between when you take it off, but essentially you're talking about a trade that is quite similar to a butterfly, you know, an iron condor, straddle, strangle, all of those types of trades, they have very similar risk profiles. There's just certain times that it might be slightly more advantageous to open. So what you're talking about there is a long dated. The only aspect that you want to nail down here is because you said long dated. I typically try to avoid long dated anything with volatility products because we, you know, they move quite a bit. So if you're talking about 90 days, oh, I don't have that spreadsheet open. I closed it. What have I got on this spreadsheet? 
nothing helpful. But if you're talking about a product that decays roughly 0.24% per day long term, and you're going to do a trade that's 90 days out, you're going to have a lot of frustrating trades where they're looking good for a couple of weeks, and then the market fizzles out, it does something different, and your trade gets screwed up. I try to keep everything on volatility ETPs in that sort of 10 to 20 day range to where you can catch those shorter term trends where like two weeks ago, I opened a trade. I knew that if nothing breaks in the market over the next two weeks, it's going to decay about a dollar or two and I'm going to make my money. And that's exactly what happened. It's far easier to predict a VXX decay factor over one to two weeks than it is 90 days out. If you're doing 90 days out and the, the short side of the calendar, 45, but that's still a month or longer out, you're, you're talking about you're going to have to layer even more than we do. So you're going to have to take it down to such a small allocation size so you can just constantly layer these trades out. I wouldn't say it's efficient. So that's the one thing that stands out is, no. We do iron condors on equity ETFs, 45 to 75 days. That's kind of typical there, taking stop losses. I wouldn't do that. It just sounds like too long. I don't like to tell people, hey, don't do this, but I think you'd be far better off doing same thing, calendars, nothing wrong with that trade structure, but doing it, say, 10 to 20 days out. That would be better. What is this? I'm on your team. You do the best you can. Keep going forward. Hopefully that's talking about me. Yeah. Um, oh, maybe because I was saying how difficult live streaming is. Yeah. I am doing the best I can. I really am. By the way, do paid subscribers get two votes? You, you can have five votes. You're a newer subscriber. I recognize the, the name. We've emailed a few times. You can have five votes. Mind if... Oh, I backtracked. We also need to cook... Do you not need the speed? Okay, we need to also cook the info in the brain. We do not need speed. When need to view two times, can you do 1.25 or 1.5? People have mentioned this before. I've never tried. I, I tried to watch a live stream or a podcast in two times speed. Sometimes people say that's what they do. They consume it in two times speed. I can't get over it. Just the voice change. The, it's just annoying. The, it's a little bit squeaky. And I don't know. For me... When I'm listening to podcasts, I do multiple per day, but it's always when I'm doing work. So, you know, when I'm doing stuff like writing, of course, I have to be totally focused. When I'm doing things like answering emails, I'm completely focused. But there are times when I'm just doing spreadsheet stuff, just preparing stuff for the next live stream or whatever it is. And if I'm doing that kind of low level, low engagement work, I've always got podcasts playing in the background. But when I play them at, you know, 1.5 or two times speed, I don't remember anything that I actually listen to. So to each their own. I prefer fully live. The rants are often informative as everyone else. You never know when the gold nugget. Okay. Yeah. I do rant. As you've noticed today, I went past my one allocation of golf analogy. I went into two. I think this was that first question that I totally butchered. No, it wasn't. I don't know. I think it is, but this is a different person. Sorry. Bail on that. Have you taken a look at BTAL anti-beta fund? It seems like a good alternative to gold or bonds. So it's not. Um, I hate to hack on somebody's brilliant idea, but essentially what BTAL does, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a fund that goes long, I believe the 50, lowest volatility names the S&P 500, and then it goes short, the highest beta names, the highest volatility names. So it's basically a long short fund that gets a net zero exposure, go long, the stable, consistent, low beta stocks, and then go short all the high beta, high volatility stocks. The problem with something like BTOL is that certainly it would have worked much better 15, 20 years ago. But if you look at the way that the markets move these days, the so-called bad assets that BTOL has identified as, you know, high beta, high volatility, we're going to short those ones. It's very common for those to be the ones these days that are actually going up. You got to remember, volatility doesn't mean up or down. A lot of people make this mistake. They think that 
like the VIX index, for example, is somehow some inverse of the S&P 500. It's not. Volatility is directionless. It doesn't mean stocks go up, VIX goes down, stocks go down, VIX goes up. That's just what happens 70% of the time. But 30% of the time, it's going the other way. They're both going the same direction. That's because volatility is just variance around a mean. So if you're in the habit, like this BTOL fund, if your methodology is to short high beta names, you might be shorting Tesla. Like, maybe not Tesla, it's not of the top 50, but you get my point is that some of those names you've identified as high flying, high beta stuff, those are not the ones you want to be shorting. So it can go on periods where it's doing pretty well, but then it can also go on periods where, wow, I'm, I'm long the boring ones that aren't moving and I'm short all the ones that are moving. If you look at S&P this year, 2023, for example, if you remove the seven top names, you know, your, your Google, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, you remove just seven of them, the S&P is barely positive this year. So those ones I'm not sure are in BTOL. We could actually probably go into the holdings and look at what they're actually doing. But uh, no, that's not a good idea. I, I think I mentioned this in a previous live stream. That sounds to me like something that a more seasoned veteran investor, somebody in their sort of 60s who have been doing this for 30 years, that's something that they probably would have cooked up. Like, oh, this is a great idea. Let's let's go long everything that's stable. Let's long Johnson & Johnson, and we'll go short all those terrible names. Well, the market doesn't work that way anymore. Sometimes those terrible names, those high-flying beta stocks are, are you know, you, you want to shorten NVIDIA? Good luck with that. So, no, it's not a replacement for gold or bonds. How would you handle the current wheel trade situation? Seems to be dropping much faster than the amount of premium that has been coming in each week. So this is an interesting question. And my short answer would be, well, my really short answer is, give me 20 seconds to open a better spreadsheet. I'll actually show you what I'm talking about. But yes, the short answer what you're getting at is if you get periods where the VXX is decaying so fast, you might end up bumping into that 10% stop loss. Let's just wait for this spreadsheet to stop beach balling on us and I'll show you my current live trades. But the wheel of fun strategy is not foolproof. There is no strategy that will be able to handle every market environment. So what is the wheel of fun doing? First of all, we are basically selling put options, cash secured put options on VXX or UVXY, and we're basically hoping to get assigned, right? We're going to collect that premium. If we don't get assigned, you go back to step one, but we're hoping we get assigned some shares. We made some money there. And then you sell a covered call, you try to dump the shares, and you try to get back into cash, and you get paid there as well. So it's basically a premium collection strategy where you collect double premium. We don't care what the underlying stock does. Who cares what VXX does? I'm trying to get in and out at the same price and get paid two premiums. But you can imagine what might happen to something like this, VXX, if you sold and you got assigned some shares right here and you got very unlucky, you could be declining downward. And let's say you got your shares assigned at a price of 30 and six months later, it's down to 10 or 15. That can actually happen. But the point is that hopefully you're collecting enough premium along the way that it kind of negates it, but it doesn't always. So I'll show you my current trade right now. I got my shares assigned at 2050. And what I did is I turned around and sold a 20, and then I sold a 1950. And then today I've sold an 1850. So if VXX expires over 1850 next week, I'm going to lose $2, right? I got assigned at 2050 and I'm going to get out at 1850. I lost two bucks. But what I'm hoping is the cumulative premium reduces that damage quite a bit. So I'm not going to lose $2. I'm going to lose, what is that, you know, 30 cents, 40 cents, something like that. But that's not always the case. And that's why we use a 10% value stop loss. And what that is, is at any point, I just add up where I'm at in the current cycle. If at any time I'm down more than 10% of my initial money that I allocated to it, let's say you allocate $25,000. If you're down $2,500 cumulatively at any point in the trade, you just shut that down. And it can happen. And it actually did happen to me earlier this year, I believe. 
I think. I'm, I remember that. So I got assigned at 13, shares called away at 12, made a bunch of money. So that one was profitable. This one, you can remember, I got my shares assigned at 50. Well, when was that? March 24th of 2000. I think that should say 2023. All of these should say 2023. Sorry about that. Um, mental note, change that. Got my shares assigned at 50. The thing dropped all the way to 25. I got, I lost $25 chasing this thing down. But what did I make in premiums on the way down? Well, I made, oh, that's going to beach ball for sure. I made, I don't know. 1737. So I lost about $8. And you can see that it wasn't a total 10% loss, but it was close. It, it can happen, right? You just, sometimes you're just out at a 10% loss. It sucks when it happens, but it does happen from time to time. I'm not going to say every year, but pretty much every year, there are periods where you might get one of those flush down periods. But does that affect the entire strategy? Is it a total abandon? No, I'm still up 18.6% just this year. And that's including a total value loss of over $2,200 on one single cycle. That sucked. I remember, you know, you get assigned in March and in July, I get my shares called away. I'm trading for four months and the whole thing ended and me just having to shut down and lose it. Yeah, it kind of sucks but I'm still up 18% this year. Hasn't happened to me on my conservative side yet. Want to see, I got shares assigned at 1250, lost them at 12, that's fine. 11 to 1050, 39 to 33, so that was a little sketchy. Um, 26, hasn't really happened to the conservative side. This one's up 9.4 this year so far. So right now I'm down about two bucks and it's actually down about $3, but that's not 10% out yet. So essentially, the, the moral of the story is here, what you're actually explaining, like, how do you deal with it? You deal with it by accepting that all trading will suffer losses from time to time. You will have periods where you get assigned at 20, and the VXX bleeds down to 10, and you're selling premium the entire way, and you didn't sell $10 worth of premium. Maybe you sold $6 or $7. Guess what? You just lost $3 of your trade. It happens, right? Every trade is going to have that. It's the same thing. Well, what if you're doing a short vol strategy and you're buying the SVIX? Well, there's going to be times where you just wake up the next day and you're down 20%, just like that, overnight in one day. What do you do? Well, what can you do? It's just part of the strategy. You better make sure that you can cycle out in one single day. You better make sure that you've got a lot of profitable periods of trend following. You just accept the fact that there's a blind spot in every single strategy. There's always somewhere it's going to fail. And with a wheel of fun on the VXX, the fail point is if it bleeds down faster than your premiums are coming in, you're losing money. Now, fortunately, it doesn't happen often. And when you gain experience, and of course, I will go through this in an entire course when I get around to it, it's no big deal. You'll get to a point where you just accept it. Ah, had a 10% stop out. That's what it's there for, right? Don't make it 20% because it might happen as well. VXX, I got assigned in March at $50. It's at 17 right now. So yeah, I got out at 25 when I wanted to, but if I stretched my stop loss to 20%, I'd probably eventually lose 20%. And I would trade for nine months and then lose 20%. I set mine at 10 because it's just realistic. That's what it is. Occasionally, every couple of years, I'm just going to have one that I just can't keep up. It's just going down too far, too fast. Premiums are not big enough. You just bleed down 10%. You're out. Start again. I don't mean to sound like no big deal. I don't mean to be callous about your financial losses. But in, in the grand scheme of things, you're going to have one. And when it happens, you know, you'll get more used to it over time. I like the educational material, but glad you're choosing QLD SSO since November 1st. Yeah, the QLD has been just rocketing for us. I actually have a video to make coming up where our defensive rotation strategy is now back in the positive range. But the QLD itself, because as I always say, losses are more costly than gains are beneficial. Well, you're staring at my dumb face here. Let's try to do a screen share. Um, this thing is still quite a ways away from breaking even, the underlying QLD. 
but because we use a strategic strategy that we are able to cycle out and actually go into utilities or cash when things are crashing, we didn't suffer the massive drawdown. Ours was about 42%, I think, and this one was 65. You might think, oh, an extra 23, that's no big deal. It's actually a huge deal <laughs> mathematically. It's kind of a kiss of death. So I, I've got a video to make that our strategy is kind of off to the races again. So it's been fun. Yeah, you're right. QLD, we've been in and out a couple of times, but basically we've been long two times NASDAQ for quite a while and enjoying it a lot. What is that? Lead to increased prices. Is there more? That seems like I'm catching you in the middle of a conversation. When all short position are reopened at the next month. I can't see any more from you. My software doesn't show me everything, as we always say every week. That seems to be kind of out of nowhere. Sorry. Email me. And if it's something that I think the rest of the community could benefit from, I'll answer it next, next live stream so everybody else can listen in. All right. What mental exercises would you recommend for your mind is telling you to, let's say, sell when your strategy is telling you to wait? Yeah, that's a tough one. How do you... Well, I mean, you have the benefit here that... You're telling, you're saying your strategy actually tells you definitively to wait. Well, this is easy. Stick to your trading rules, always. Bad things happen when you break your own system. Your system was there for a reason. I would assume you're like most people, you're like me, you designed your strategy under non-stressful conditions. You were like me sitting in Starbucks drinking too many Frappuccinos, designing this strategy with, with your full focus for probably multiple weeks or months, and there's the strategy. You're going to allow your fear in the moment, in a 10-minute span of watching the market go in the wrong direction, you're going to allow that to override that calm three-month cycle where you were just focused and thinking of everything and cross-referencing all your numbers and making sure everything checks out, you're not really going to default to, I'm scared now, I'm going to just throw this out, right? So that's why we say, always follow your trading rules. The reason they're set up in the first place is for this exact situation. You're going to, you're going to have things every day that make you question whether you should do it or not. Because as I talked about before, opportunity cost, there's opportunity cost with everything in the world, right? You can't do everything at the same time. You can't A-B test your life. You've got to go in a direction and just hope that you made the right call. So the, the most beneficial thing that you've said here, I think it's easy for you. What a lot of other people are facing, imagine how tough this would be, is they're scared in the moment. They don't know what to do, but they don't have a system that was well thought out in three months of calm Starbucks sessions. They don't have a system at all. They're just winging it. For those people, I don't know what to do other than tell them, look, you've got to set up some structure ahead of time so that when you face that position, you know what to do. Is a third golf analogy in a live stream too much? What is the point of a pre-shot routine in golf? Why do I start behind the ball, visualize my shot, takes me 17 seconds, I take three steps to the ball, starting with my left leg, Go there, look at the hole twice, look down, make sure everything's good, fire, pull the trigger. Don't think about anything. Don't let anything enter my bubble. 17 seconds-ish, and I'm good to go. I remember my dad was stopwatch timing me for like a year. I was training this pre-shot routine. Why do I do that? Well, it's because I don't want to allow that fear that, look, if I screw up this shot, 400 people are going to be laughing at me. They're watching me right now. I'm controlling it ahead of time, so I'm just a robot. I'm just going to do what I do, calculate the yardage, take my three steps, fire, pull the trigger. Trading should be the same thing. And it sounds to me like yours is because you said that your strategy is telling you to wait. That's awesome that you have a strategy. Most people don't. Most people ask this question, how do I know to do X, Y, and Z? Well, if you've got 
nothing that you sat calmly at a desk and crunched numbers and made sure of, then you've got no default. You've, you've only got A. You don't have A, B. So you're, you're fine. You're just going to have to deal with the fact that life is uncertain. Trading is uncertain. And every single day, you're going to wonder whether you did the right thing. When I took my trade today, I took my trade and I got 15, I think I got 16 cents or 17. I got 17 cents for my trade. When I executed my trade, because I had to do it before the live stream, I was actually worried that it was going to go the other way because it was down a little bit before, but the S&P 500 was not moving. And I was thinking in my head, this 17 cents, I'll bet you an hour from now it's 10 cents. That's what I thought it was going to happen, right? But I have to pull the trigger anyway because I send, I execute my trades within the same time period every day, try to be consistent. And what ended up happening is it actually worked in my favor. I actually got a better price. But I was in the moment worried about, not worried, but I was conscious of the fact that I'm, I feel like I'm going to get a better price if I wait an hour. But I can't allow that to actually manifest. I've got a system. I followed it every day, calmly and patiently. Why am I going to change now? So hopefully somewhere in that long rant, there's the answer for you. But if you didn't mention that your strategy is telling you to do the opposite, I think you'd be in trouble. And I would tell you, you need to get a, a lot of coffees in you and build strategies. Done. Easy. There's no mental exercises necessary. Just trust your strategy. In the moment when you're worried, that's what it's there for. That's your pre-shot routine, your strategy. Tells you what to do. All right. I think there's only a couple left, maybe one left. Trend following has higher expected value than mean reversion, but it's psychologically difficult to consistently execute. Hence, most traders lose money despite a market beating strategy being there. Yes. Um, I, I would totally agree with that, that certainly at this time, like in the last 20 years, trend following is, I, I would always default to that whenever necessary. Because, you know, being a contrarian, this isn't 1980 Warren Buffett days. This is a different market, you know, side tangent, he's underperforming the market in this new new age market. So it's different. Yeah, you do. You definitely want to trend follow. But the problem is, there's always going to be those people that feel like they got to get off the train, right? VXX has declined so far, it would be insane for us to continue holding our position, right? I mean, I don't want to talk anybody into anything here, but this position's doing pretty well. I mean, it's basically crushing it, right? There's a lot of people who would be saying, well, we got to get out of this thing. I don't know what it's up this month, but a lot, right? This strategy is obviously doing pretty well. We got into it right at the beginning of the month and crushing it, right? What are, what are we at? Let me try to ballpark this, 86 to 90s. Yeah, that, I mean, this is going to be up 15%, something like that. So you might think to yourself, like you're getting at, trend following is hard. I'm up 15%. Shouldn't I close this trade? Just take the money. Let's get out of here. Well, no, because what if it's 2017? I, I've had trades in the tactical volatility strategy. I actually might have, no. I am constantly have the wrong spreadsheet open. I've actually shown the top 10 returns for that strategy. And one of them was well over 100%. I think it was 120% in one single trade. Enter, exit, didn't get out, made 120%. So I'm up 15 now in a pretty killer month, feeling pretty great. Trend followers who have a difficult time staying on that train, they're going to be bailing out, right? They're never going to get that 100% return. They're never going to be that guy that just gets a trade that really pays them. Every three or four years, you get that real payoff. They're never going to have that. They're going to bail. Like, after the pandemic, 2020, right in April or May, the markets just flip on a dime and they just rocket higher. W what if you were in something that was up 20% in a month and you got out of it? Well, it had another 80% to go if you're talking about, you know, leveraged NASDAQ or something. Yeah, it's hard. You're right. Trend following is, is mentally tough. For some reason, there, there's something something attractive about the contrarian position. I see so many people when volatility is low, they're able to buy the VXX. They're able to buy long shares of UVXY when the VIX is 10. 
it, it just makes no sense to me. Like, this is just such a losing position, statistically and mentally. But for some reason, some people are able to talk themselves into being a contrarian, and they, they do that. I'm a trend follower. I don't have this problem. Let's say, I should not jinx this. Let's say Monday, SVXY crashes 15% and I lose all the profit that I made in November. I still made the right decision to stay in the trade over the weekend because that's what the strategy says to do. I'm not going to break it. Even though sometimes it's even a challenge. You think, well, it, it you know, tempting. I lost money last month, right? October was, a, or was it? Yeah, about down about 1%, 2%. So yeah, it's a little bit tempting. Hey, if I get out now, if I just sell everything and move to cash, I'm up 8%. I can recover all of that plus another 6%. I'm not going to do that. My strategies, they're good. I, I spent years building this stuff. I'm not going to allow my in-the-moment emotions to, to cloud that. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Here we've got a super chat, $10. Is that real? Um, I think that's real. I super appreciate it. Thank you so much. One thing that I will say, though, um, for next time is my live streams are always totally free. So don't don't uh, super chat me. You don't have to give me any money, but you can ask all your questions you want. Just ask them in the comments. You can email me. You know, I do Zoom calls with people. Uh, the, I really, again, I don't want to diminish, you know, the gesture. I really appreciate it. But I don't ever want people to feel like, they have to pay me a super chat to get a question answered. This is entirely for you know the public. Everybody on YouTube, everybody on Twitter can show up and ask anything they want. So thank you so much. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. And uh, you've got free questions for life. Thank you. Impressed with your content and appreciate your deep understanding. Thank you. Appreciate that, Peter. Another question, I think. Quick question. Do you think that the VIX futures term structure or what you said to as the cash VIX term structure are more reliable and predictive as a volatility measure? Two different things. So VIX futures, the VIX futures term structure is VIX futures, right? Freely traded. It's just an open market buying and selling of VIX futures. That's obviously a very good place to get trade signals because it's consistent over time. As long as you're using percentiles, we can get a pretty good idea for what the pulse of the market is doing off those VIX futures. The cash VIX term structure refers to the VIX 9D, the VIX, VIX 3M, VIX 6M. I can actually show you instead of just counting on my fingers. Um, the cash VIX term structure is all of these indexes also makes a term structure based on a different time frame. So everybody kind of knows the VIX index, but the VIX index, remember, is based, it's it's a statistic, it's not tradable, but it's a statistic derived from S&P 500 options over a 30-day period. It's an annualized number, but it's a 30-day strip of options expiring exactly 30 days. The VIX 90 is just the same thing expiring in nine days. Options expiring in nine days, a full strip of all options. VIX 3M is three months, VIX 6M, six months, one Y. Yeah, clever, right? Um, so this makes a term structure. This signal is coming from an entirely different place than the VIX futures. So it's not either or. They are both among the top things that you can be looking at in the market. The VIX futures term structure, fantastic for an open, freely traded market. And a lot of those futures are being traded from institutions and you could say more sophisticated investors. There aren't too many you know, random newbies that are trading VIX futures. So it's, you know, pretty solid data there. And then again, the same thing on the cash VIX term structure, totally different place, S&P 500 options, but again, a little bit more sophistication there. And so I would weigh them just about equal, to be honest. I think that as far as our metrics go, I don't weigh the importance. The cash VIX oscillator is something that I created. It's it's a more complex thing designed basically all of this condensed down into a single number. And the VX30 to VIX roll yield is the basically the ratio of the VIX futures to the VIX index, right? That's calculating how the products actually move around. I don't rank these higher or lower than each other. I think they're both excellent metrics and I rank them among my top five or six, I would say, both of those. So yeah, was that your question? Quick question. 
Yes, absolutely. And to go a step further, why, right? Why, why are we looking at volatility metrics? Why aren't I looking at a 50 and a 200 day crossover? I don't know if anybody does that, but you know, you see people sometimes, well, we're getting pretty close to that 50 day moving average. Well, who cares, right? That depending on where you started, that could be totally different. If you have a stock market run up, right? That started right at that 50 day or 200 day moving average, and then it goes up five or 10%, that's a totally different eventual crossover than if the run up started when you were way below those metrics already or way above them already, right? The starting point basically means everything. But with volatility metrics, like I said, as long as you're ranking them percentile wise, a 95th percentile volatility spike in 1994 is the same exit signal as a 95% volatility spike in 2023. The number, the nominal number might be different, but all of these volatility metrics and all of these events manifest extremely similar across time. It's really the only thing that does that. If you look at all the other technical analysis that people look at, it's all variable to what's going on in the moment. That's why some people who, let's say they're using gamma flip points or something like that for their trading signals. Sometimes they can nail it perfectly. Other times they just get it ass backwards, right? Well, why is that happening? Why is separated over three years, the same signal led to completely different results? It's because it's not uniform across time. Really volatility metrics are the only thing that I can see the numbers in 1994, and it's basically the same relative ratios that I see today. Again, nominal numbers are different, right? the VIX at 20 or VIX at 12, it's all kind of, you know, nominal numbers. But relative movement, relative strength, it's all the same thing to me. So that's why I'm able to consistently get sort of robust signals across time. I, I can't think of anything else that does that. I don't know what this means. Hand, pink, waving. I don't know what this means, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of this, right? Yeah, thank you again for the super chat. And whenever it happens, I kind of, it kind of takes me back because um, it doesn't happen often. Most live streams at the very beginning, I tell people, remember, don't super chat, don't give me any money, give me one of these. That's all it is. The cost of the live stream is a thumbs up and that is it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm here for as long as people have questions. Okay, Maybe too late to the party today. Do you still research for new strategies? Yes, I'm an absolute certified workaholic and I'm always crunching numbers on new things. I've got 15 strategies always on the go, always trying to perfect them, but I'm very strict, right? I've, I have a great track record, which means that in order for something to make, I don't know if I can make a basketball analogy here, but to, to make my starting five lineup, basically, because we've got five strategies right now, in order for something to jump in here and, and make the starting five lineup for the All-Star game, it's going to have to have managed multiple years of live trading. It's going to have to have a very specific reason for why it's in the strategy. The correlations have to all match up. The risk reward and the position sizing has to make sense, not only on its own, but in the context of the other four or five strategies. So it's actually, you know, moral of the story, it's actually very difficult for my new stuff to beat what's already been working for, you know, over a decade now. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen from time to time. It just means that it it actually takes quite a bit. I've I went through that phase in 2005, 2007 ish. Back then, when I first started investing, I went through the phase where everything I looked at just seemed amazing, and I was just couldn't wait to sh just fire that in and, and start crunching. You know, put it in the portfolio right away. I have learned in the last what is it almost you know 18 years that you really have to see something through multiple good and bad periods. Every strategy has a fail point, has a something where it just, it encounters a market it can't handle. That's going to happen. You really want to make sure you test things until it happens. You don't want to kind of think, well, this could happen. I would rather trade until it does happen because a very good strategy, maybe it'll only happen a few times, right? Maybe once every five or 10 years. If you see it happen in live trading, you can learn so much from that experience. So I've got a lot of things going on the side that are good. I mean, I think they're good. I mean, it's kind of a shameless plug, but I think they're good. 
And I could put them in the portfolio, but they're just not going to beat the structure that I have now. I don't want to sound arrogant. It, I'm really not. I, you know, I'm just saying basically what I believe the truth to be. But this setup that we've got with this portfolio is really strong. I, I wouldn't make any changes. That doesn't mean it always works. Of course, it has periods where it's going to lose money. 2022, I'm not sure anything really could handle that. Our iron condors were up 25% or something. But anything other than delta neutral iron condors, I don't know what worked in 2022, to be honest. But this is such a good setup right now that my other stuff, I don't... I don't know if it makes the all-star squad, to be honest. My VIX options always does. That's fantastic, but it's separate. So, yeah, hopefully I answered your question there, too. Oh, this is interesting. The, I mean, short answer, no, but I, I know what you're getting at. Do you think about VX, TLT, or move index strategy for bonds. Essentially, you're talking about volatility indexes for the bond market. No, I don't. I don't think it's robust enough. And it's not it's not directly applicable to what I'm doing, right? If you were, a, you know, if you were a bond guy, and you were literally trading the bond market, then yeah, I would say that's probably good or trading options around bond funds, as a very common thing, then sure. But for me, I always go to the big Big markets for me, the S&P 500, S&P 500 options market, all the VIX related stuff, cash VIX term structure, freely traded VIX futures. These places for us are, are far more relevant. I cringe. I have so many ideas and so much work that I want to do. It's just, it's hard. What have I got? This is going to be a little spoiler for some people. Move this around. So just to give you an idea of sort of like my plans and why this option course kind of gets delayed is there's always more stuff that I want to do. So this is just a general VTS content stream. This is kind of what I, I want to move towards. So I want a new course talking about the VTS, and I've got it basically listed. These are all independent strategies that I have planned. So this course is right now 34 videos that I have to make, and each one of those takes 5 to 10 hours. I want to do a volatility dashboard course, full course, breaking down our entire dashboard. All right, I think this is important. I think people will appreciate that one. And so this one, breaking all this down, what is that going to be? Like 23 videos, again, five to 10 hours each. This is a self-serving one. This is one, um, I call it self-serving because I've never done any marketing before, but I want to kind of start to not not be, a, you know, an arrogant in-your-face type of guy, but kind of make things that, I don't know, sell the portfolio a little bit. And I've got a bunch of ideas there for individual videos. I want to do a volatility landscape course. So basically checking out what the each individual one means. Defense, each individual strategy should have a course. An investing 101, these are all individual videos I could do, 20 more there. Master spreadsheet, I could do the power rankings. This is essentially, you know, 50th percentile. What would happen if you shorted volatility 50th percentile of all of these metrics and kind of compare them in a power ranking, another risk adjusted, a versus series, sort of normalizing the drawdown return of different things. You can't compare Bitcoin and SPY because Bitcoin has like 95% drawdowns, right? So what if you normalize the SPY and the Bitcoin drawdown wise, which one actually returns more? And then if you normalize SPY versus hedge funds, ARK index versus NASDAQ, that would be a fun series. How many ways to short volatility, tips for entrepreneurs, minimalism. That's just one of the things that I'm planning. VTX shorts, these are all short videos I could make, you know, one, one minute videos on all of these things. This is just giving an idea. And then the VTS options stuff, when this finally launches, a course breaking down all of those things, options 101, self-serving again, a lot of ideas to kind of sell the thing. I've got my hands full. So that is a long way of saying, I don't know. I don't know. I've got so many ideas for so many, so many things that I think people would be interested in. I just, I have a problem 
sort of figuring out one direction and going until I finish that. I, I tend to have three or four projects on the go. Um, what I should probably do is figure out how to do this very streamlined. And so I probably I'll just put it to the community at some point in the next couple of weeks. I'll just say, here's seven courses that I'm thinking of doing. Which ones are you most interested in seeing? And we will just rank those because we've already got courses going. Let me see if, if I can actually access my courses. We've got the tactical volatility course that's coming along nicely. I don't know how many lessons there are in this one. I think there's something like 12 or 13. This one's coming along pretty good. And then, of course, the Iron Condor course, if people aren't aware. This is 30 videos in this course, breaking down everything to do with Iron Condors. I know this kind of sounds like an advertisement. It's really not. Um, sign up if you like. <laughs> don't if you don't. But I'm just pointing out that the course structure works well for me these days. But as I just showed you, I've got some pretty good ideas with pretty extensive, you know, 20, 30, 40 part cor video courses. Which one do people want to see? I could be busy for the next 10 years putting that stuff together. So where's your question? <laughs> when, is the, when is the option course coming? Um, next or Early next year? I'll try. I don't know. By the way, how, do you, how did your VIX option strategy do the last three months? Fine. Last three months was nothing. Down, of course, is fine. I can't even tease it. I can't even tease it. It's just going to, if I say something, you're going to have 10 follow-up questions. It's just, sorry, I have to punt on that one. It did fine. I don't want to be rude and arrogant again, but it pretty much always does fine. I've, I've got it pretty fine-tuned. I've been trading it for 13 years now. Every month, like clockwork, it rarely goes wrong. How does your VIX options show the list of things for the next 15 years? Yeah, not 15, but a, a few. Definitely a few. Another course I didn't even show you, but the, the spreadsheet course. I want to have a spreadsheet, and then every video I break down something and actually add it to the spreadsheet so people can download the spreadsheet. Tons of stuff that I could do. All right, a couple of questions. Are the strategies a la carte, or do they form natural hedges? Is it trading around a core position or a balanced set of strategies? So what I always look at, where, where am I? What happened here? I have to log into something. Oh, I don't need that. Hand gestures. Nothing wrong with hand gestures. So five strategies. I always consider them independent. So what I, I don't add anything to the portfolio that couldn't act as a standalone strategy. So iron condors, for example. It can act completely independently. If a person only did iron condors and that's it, they're not interested in any of my other work, the performance is, is just fine. I, I don't think anybody would complain about the performance of the iron condor strategy. Let me just try to find a picture just so you can put a, a picture to the strategy. This is my blog. There's got to be something here. Essentially, this is the iron condor strategy. Nobody's going to complain with this super low drawdown, very consistent, standalone strategy. So everything in the portfolio can do that. The defensive rotation, totally on its own if you want. Now, it did have a 42% drawdown, so you, know, you have to factor that in. But yes, everything is independent on its own. And then when you put them together, if every indef independent strategy that I have has a mechanism to move to safety, it has minimized drawdowns, it has good performance long term. If all of those are true, putting five of them together in the same portfolio, they will all have low correlation to each other, and then they're all adding something. The problem that a lot of people as investors have is that they're adding things to their portfolio that aren't really adding diversification. People think that, okay, if I'm holding a balanced buy and hold fund of some stocks, some international stocks, well, correlations go to one in a crisis add some real estate funds. That's no different than the NASDAQ in a crisis. Add, add this, add that. It's not really doing anything. My strategies are designed that 
they're they're not taking any information from each other. I don't ever open a NASDAQ trade because I have something else open. They're all independent. But when you put things together that all on their own beat the spy, rate of return, lower drawdown, putting them all together, correlations are super low, and they all have a purpose. So volatility trend is the worst performing strategy we have. I think it's around 13, 14% a year, but it's negative correlation to the stock market. So obviously that's exceptional, right? If you can make 13% return on something with negative stock market correlation, most people, their negative stock market correlation is bonds, which are flat for the last 15 years, or gold, flat for the last 15 years. We've got something that's very consistent, 13% return and negative correlation. So they all have their purpose in the strategy. And then putting them together, yeah. So there's no real core. I suppose you could say that one of them is the flagship, but nope, they've all got their individual there, there are people who, for whatever reason, don't like certain strategies. Some people don't like trading options, so they only do those three. It's fine. They can do whatever they want. But I do all five. I think it adds the most diversification. If you trade just one of them, rate of return-wise, it's probably the same as trading all five of them. It's just I do like to reduce drawdowns. I do like to have you know, long NASDAQ, long the SPY, plus delta neutral iron condors, plus inverse VXX butterflies, all in the same portfolio, definitely better than just tracking the stock market. All right, I think I got all the questions. How long did that take? All right, so if everybody could follow me on Twitter, at VolatilityVix, and vote in that poll. I want to know if people like live streams that might feel like they drag on a little bit, or just let me rant. Whatever you want, I will default to. The community is always right. All right. So we will see you next week. Hopefully, uh, I've got the, uh, the uh, system down, and I'll just go with it for the next 30, 40 weeks.